and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Substance Abuse, What You Need to Know and Where to Go. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, CE credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses, expiring on February 28, 2017, and two years for social workers, expiring on February 28, 2018. If you are watching this program on demand and want to receive a Social Work Continuing Education Certificate, then you will need to complete the Social Work test and send it in, along with your sign-in sheet and evaluation. If you are watching this program live, there is no social work test required. I'm Renee Carpenter, State Social Work Director for the Alabama Department of Public Health, and with me is Brittany Wiggins, Executive Director of Mental Health America in Montgomery. Welcome, Brittany. I'll Hi. turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, like Renee said, I'm Brittany Wiggins. I'm the Executive Director of Mental Health America in Montgomery. Um, we are a nonprofit agency here in Montgomery. We are funded through the United Way. And part of our mission, part of our purpose is to educate the community, not just um, our general population, but our medical professionals as well um, about different mental health topics. Um, Renee contacted me a couple of months ago and asked that I come and speak to you today um, about substance abuse. Um, substance abuse and mental health problems are just huge in our community and across the, across America. Um, so today what I want to talk to you to about is let's talk about what substance abuse is, um, what it means, what is the definition of substance abuse, um, how it relates to other illnesses, and some of the treatment options that are available um, across the state of Alabama. Um, substance abuse is a huge burden to our community. We know that. It costs a lot of money. Um, more than $484 billion per year is spent um, on substance abuse problems, whether it's um, missing days of work, uh, low productivity, medical costs, health care costs. It is a huge burden to our society. Illicit drug use alone accounts for $161 billion a year in America. Um, drug abuse is linked with tons of adverse effects, um, which we're going to talk about today, some of them. Infectious diseases, crimes, accidents, pregnancies, uh, low productivity at work. Um, half of the individuals that live with a chronic alcohol or drug abuse problem also have a chronic mental health problem. This is huge, and this is really important to understand. Um, our state looks at substance abuse problems and mental health problems as one and the same. Uh, before we started today, I was speaking with Renee, and we were talking about how um, the comorbidity is, rate is so high with individuals with substance abuse um, problems. A lot of times it's difficult for clinicians to decide which came first. What is the primary disease and what is the secondary disease? So we'll talk a little bit about that today um, as well. Um, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of emergency room visits, hospital visits, every single year because of substance abuse problems. Usually accidents related to substance abuse problems, um, most of which are never paid for. So again, it, is, uh, it produces a huge burden on our society. So what is addiction? It's important for us today to determine the definition of addiction. So I'm going to read this for you. Addiction is a chronic, often relapsing brain disease that causes compulsive drug seeking and use, 
despite harmful consequences to the addicted individuals or those around the addicted individual. The important piece of this definition is despite harmful consequences. So is drug use, um, drug seeking behavior despite harmful consequences. And again, this is more often than not a relapsing brain disease. So what are some of the consequences? Let's talk about some of, of the drugs that, that we know, some things that are really common. We're going to talk about several today. We're going to talk about alcohol, we're going to talk about marijuana, cocaine, and some that we have just started really talking about, especially in the media, including bath salts, molly, and ecstasy. We want to talk about some of those as well and how those um, drugs relate to other illnesses that an individual may have or how they cause illnesses, um, physical illnesses. So alcohol. We have something like 80,000 deaths every single year in the United States that are attributed to excessive alcohol use. Uh, we know alcohol is legal, it's easily accessible to old people and young people alike. But some, again, 80,000 deaths are caused each year in the United States because of alcohol use. Um, excessive alcohol use is the third leading cause of lifestyle death in America. So preventable diseases, preventable death, but caused by your lifestyle, it's the third um, leading cause. Um, we're looking at the dietary guidelines for Americans, right? Let's talk about what drinking in moderation looks like. Um, most of the time, nutritionists and dietary guidelines say, well, drinking in moderation is okay. It's healthy, not a problem. What that looks like for women is one drink a day. And for men, it's two drinks a day. That's what drinking in moderation looks like. Um, however, binge drinking is when a lot of times you start stepping over into the addiction part of alcoholism uh, or of alcohol use is four or more drinks on a single occasion for men or five drinks on a, um, excuse me, four for women or five for men. Um, so we hear a lot about this like several years ago. I remember when I was, I was young and um, this binge drinking, the idea of binge drinking was huge and it was causing all these problems amongst college students. And um, I remember a, a speaker coming to my school and they talked about binge drinking and how horrible binge drinking was for you. Uh, the reality of it is this binge drinking, it looks like a regular day for a lot of U.S. citizens. Um, heavy drinking is more than one drink a day for men and more than two drinks uh, per day. Excuse me, I keep getting it backwards. One for women, two for men. Um, heavy drinking. Um, so who, who shouldn't drink? Well, we know. Anybody under the age of 21 in the state of Alabama, 21 is the legal age for consuming alcohol. Um, anyone who, according to the Surgeon General, anyone who is um, pregnant on certain prescription medications or over-the-counter medications. Also, it's important to note that people who are medically vulnerable, uh, people who have um, certain physical ailments, certain physical diseases should not participate in drinking. And of course, people that are doing any kind of anything that requires any kind of skill like driving, um, operating, uh, ex large equipment, etc. So the health risk, what are they? Um, some of the immediate health risk, of course we mentioned earlier how a lot of individuals are uh, coming in the emergency rooms and other emergency care departments, hospital visits, um, are because of injury, um, violent activity, risky sexual behavior, um, some of the other immediate uh, risk are miscarriage and stillbirth, as, as well as alcohol poisoning. Um, alcohol poisoning, especially in college towns, you see it so much. And here in Montgomery, of course, we have several um, universities and four-year colleges here in the Montgomery area. And the emergency rooms in Montgomery 
on any given weekend or weeknight see several individuals that come in with alcohol poisoning. So that is one of the immediate health risks, as well as injury, um, vehicular injuries, work-related injuries, um, indiv uh, injuries that are caused by <laughs> neglect, things of that sort are a huge immediate health risk for alcohol um, consumption. Some of the long-term health risks. Uh, individuals um, sometimes can develop um, dementia. They have heart attacks and strokes because of the vascular effects that alcohol has on your body. Um, some of the uh, another long-term health risk is some psychiatric disorders like depression and anxiety. Um, as a mental health professional, I can tell you that we often see individuals that are uh, that have alcoholism. They also have depression. Um, sometimes it's hard to determine if the alcoholism caused the depression or the depression caused the alcoholism uh, because of self-medicating uh, habits, but it's very common to see depression in alcoholics. Um, family problems and unemployment are long-term risk as well, um, and those are health risks. Those are not just societal risks. Um, Family problems oftentimes and unemployment oftentimes in turn goes back to our mental health problems that are caused by alcoholism. You see depression and anxiety in these individuals. Alcoholism also causes cancer um, and liver diseases and gastrointestinal problems. So individuals who are already prone to having GI upset or um, fatty liver diseases um, are much more likely to develop cancer and other complications because of their alcohol use. Um, the, next, the next drug that we want to talk about is marijuana. Of course we know right now in our state and all across America, one of the biggest things that people are talking about right now during our election um, election season is the legalization of marijuana. We're talking about it nonstop, it seems like. And some states have already chosen to do so. But let's talk about um, what marijuana looks like, what health problems that it causes. Um, it is the most commonly abused illicit drugs in, drug in the United States. Again, it's kind of like alcohol these days. It's easy to get, it's easy to find, um, so people are using it more and more and more and at a much younger age than we've seen in the past. Um, some people that come in for um, substance abuse treatment are, they say, oh, well, I started using marijuana when I was eight years old. So we're seeing it younger and younger and younger the first time use. Um, it does have an adverse effect on learning and memory that can last for years after the, the user quits using. Um, we're seeing individuals that have ADD, ADHD, that have um, other cognitive development issues that are linked back to early use of marijuana. Um, heavy smokers, on average, um, have lose IQ points. Uh, especially for people between the age of 13 and 38. They lose um, IQ points. And again, this goes back to the cognitive effects that marijuana has on the body. Um, many times the cognitive abilities that are lost cannot be regained. Um, with other drugs, you will see kind of a rebound in cognitive abilities, a rebound in liver damage, or a rebound in brain damage. But with marijuana, those abilities are often not regained. Um, so what does this mean for us physically? Let's talk about the health problems. Um, people that are heavy marijuana users, they have an increased heart rate. So individuals that already have um, some kind of heart disease, um, this could be potentially fatal for them. Um, they're more likely to have a heart attack than non-users. There's a persistent cough and chest infections, lung infections, uh, respiratory illnesses, and weight gain as well um, that, that goes along with marijuana usage. What is really interesting is um, I've seen this time and time again 
in my personal life from people that I know and also with um, people that have come in for substance abuse treatment, we see these individuals that have these constant respiratory illnesses. Um, you know, COPD and other um, bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, that's caused by or exacerbated by their marijuana use. This could be potentially dangerous, especially for individuals that have pre existing respiratory illnesses uh, like asthma, for example. Um, so that's something that is, is of great concern um, for your health, especially when uh, we're talking about marijuana use. Um, so let's talk about the mental health things that are related with marijuana. Um, it can produce some, um, a temporary psychotic reaction. It is possible for marijuana usage to produce hallucinations and paranoia. Now, individuals that use heavily or they are pro-legalization will argue you down <laughs> about this specific fact. But there is a significant link between um, marijuana use and later in life development of psychosis and mental illness. We are seeing much older people that use marijuana heavily throughout their teenage years and on into their maybe 30s and into their 40s. We're seeing those people as geriatric mental health clients who have never presented with any mental health disorder before. But the only place that it can be linked back to is their marijuana usage. And it does cause anxiety and depression and um, sometimes suicidal thoughts as well. So that's what we see most often. Those are some health side effects from marijuana use. Um, personality disturbances, lack of motivation, weight gain. A lot of times those are societal problems more than anything, not societal, social problems. Uh, most of the time that's where we see the biggest problems with those three things. Um, but the weight gain can be potentially, um, potentially dangerous because any time that an individual you know, gains a significant amount of weight, then they're at risk for uh, diabetes, um, heart disease, stroke as well. Okay, so let's talk about Molly and ecstasy. This is something that, you know, we've talked about a little bit more often in the news lately, things that people have heard a little bit more about. Um, there are a tremendous amount of emergency room visits um, that are linked to um, ecstasy, Molly, um, certain amphetamines as well. Um, there are stimulants and hallucinogenics. Um, these individuals usually feel great. You know, there's a lot of increased energy. They feel euphoria. Um, there's a feeling of closeness with other individuals. Um, a lot of times their sensory processes can be distorted as well. It's a relatively, um, the, the effects are relatively short term. The, you know, what you feel is usually three to six hours. Um, but where it becomes particularly interesting is because we, we know that our brain, chem all of our body processes, especially our brain pot processes, are either um, regulated by chemicals or electrical impulses. Uh, when you use drugs like Molly and Ecstasy, it releases a huge surge of serotonin, dopamine, and norepine norepinephrine. Um, those are all of those really feel-good chemicals that we have in our brain. They regulate emotion, um, they help regulate sleep cycles, depression, um, but it also um, triggers the release of oxytocin, which is that chemical, if you've ever had a baby, you've heard about it before, you know, it's the one that um, helps with breastfeeding and helps when you bond with your children, um, but that hormone is also released with the use of Molly and the use of ecstasy, and that's what help, that's what gives people that social closeness feeling. It's a bonding hormone. Um, some of the the health effects. Um, these two drugs are incredibly uh, incredibly dangerous, and they are becoming um, a huge problem in our society. Um, we're seeing people with heart disease. Um, serious muscle tension that actually sometimes ends up causing um, long-term musculoskeletal um, issues, nausea, dental problems. A lot of people were seeing 
um, and they have for years because of the, the need to clench teeth, clench your teeth together because of the constriction of your muscles. Um, people are having broken teeth. You know, they're um, basically crushing fillings or um, crowns that have been done. So their dental, their, their dental health greatly suffers. And we know that when our oral health is bad, then we start having um, problems with our vascular system and with our heart as well. And it makes us much more susceptible to um, certain types of diseases and illnesses um, and infection especially. Um, and it also uh, increases your body temperature. All of our body processes have um, an optimal temperature at which they, they work. Um, that's why sometimes we feel like it's so dangerous when someone has a temperature of 105 or 106 because our body processes don't operate as well at, at those temperatures. And that's one of the problems that we're seeing with Molly and with ecstasy. Well, high, high body temperature. Um, also, blurred vision, liver failure and kidney failure are particularly huge problems with these two drugs. So someone, for example, that has diabetes, we know that diabetes oftentimes affects your liver. It affects your kidney function. So people that already have diseases like diabetes are at much higher risk for complete liver failure and complete kidney failure. Um, individuals that already have hypertension, for example, we know that that affects our kidneys, that our kidneys um, regulate or help to regulate our, um, our blood pressure. So individuals with hypertension are coming into the ER that have used drugs and they're in cardiac arrest or they're having heart attacks and oftentimes we we start looking around trying to figure out what it is that they've been using and molly or ecstasy are, are one of those drugs um, prescription drug abuse and over-the-counter medication drug abuse is starting to become more and more and more prevalent in our society today. We know that it's been a problem for several years. It's been a problem forever, really. Um, we all know that the Beatles song, We All Live in a Yellow Submarine. Well, it's not about a yellow submarine. It's about prescription drug abuse. Um, because there are all these housewives back then that were hooked on these prescription drugs, and that's what the song is about. Um, so it's been a problem for a long, long time. But nowadays, unfortunately, this problem is growing larger and larger and larger. These drugs are more readily available because they're, getting, they're coming from doctor's offices, pain clinics, the emergency room. Um, it, it's always so interesting. You'll have somebody go into the ER that has hurt themselves, and they're allergic to everything but Dilaudid. Everything but Dilaudid. Those individuals are there to get medication, and we know that. And it's becoming a, a, a huge health crisis, and it's becoming a huge burden on our health care system because oftentimes these drugs are incredibly expensive. Um, so we're seeing, again, these prescription drugs are not just prescription drugs anymore. Um, they're becoming, you know, illicit drugs, basically. Um, and the way that individuals are using them is becoming more and more dangerous to their health. Um, some of the most commonly abused prescription drugs, we know this. We've heard about it. We've talked about it. Pain relievers, Vicodin, Oxycontin, um, stimulants like Adderall, Ritalin, um, Concerta. Individuals um, are pumping these medications into their children. Sometimes they're greatly needed for ADD and ADHD. Um, but when I was in college, I was seeing, and I lived a very sheltered life. So when I was in college, I was seeing these individuals that were like, you know, taking three and four and five Adderalls a day. And I'm like, what in the world is going on here? But it's because they're incredibly addictive. And the effects that they have are, um, well, s desirable <laughs> to some people. Um, depressants like Valium and Xanax, um, they are also d hugely, hugely abused in, in our community and in across America, really. Um, one of the most commonly abused over-the-counter drugs 
are cough suppressants, especially ones containing um, an ingredient called DXM. Um, DXM is a cough suppressant. People will go into the, the drugstore, the grocery store, and buy these drugs, you cough syrup, just so they can have the effects of DXM. And it gives that euphoric feeling and the high feeling that you would kind of feel with some of the other drugs like Oxycontin and uh, Xanax, things of that sort. It's one of the reasons why in the state of Alabama you have to show your ID. Um, to purchase certain kind of cold medicines, not just the ones that have the ephedrines in them that individuals are using to produce meth, but also um, the some of the drugs that have DXM in it. I went to the um, to Walmart a couple of days ago to buy some uh, cough medicine, some cold medicine, and they're like, "Oh, well, what's your birthday, ma'am?" And I had to stop and think for a minute because I don't buy cough medicine or cold medicine very often. I had to stop and think, what in the world? And then I thought, oh, yeah, I know why they're doing this. And it's because the ingredients in it, um, individuals, I hate to say they love it, but individuals that have substance abuse problems are really drawn sometimes to these over-the-counter medications. It's because they're easy to get. Um, they're very available. Um, so a lot of times it's quite appealing to individuals with substance abuse disorders. And, and Brittany, okay. I'll, I'm sorry to interrupt okay. you, but while we're on the subject of over-the-counter, I'm assuming that as healthcare professionals, we need to educate our patients about the necessity to include over-the-counter medications in their list of medications when they're going to the ER or if yes. they're at a new doctor's office to make yes. sure that there, there's not a contraindication there. Absolutely. Many of the medications that you would receive um, for a sinus infection or um, other kind of, of problem that you would go to the emergency room for or to your local um, urgent care facility or even your primary care doctor, um, some of those medications that you take over the counter, um, they raise your blood pressure. Um, they also produce um, a few other side effects that are really important for you to to know and to recognize when you are being prescribed these other um, prescription drugs. Um, a lot of times we will see drug interactions, accidental drug interactions, um, especially in our elderly population. We see that a lot. Um, a lot of people go in through the emergency room, um, elderly people that may have, or people that have a lot of physical health uh, diseases already. They're going in through the emergency room or urgent care, someone who's not their primary care physician, and they're on this really long list of medications, but they can't really remember what they are or, you know, um, they forgot it at home. And then they're being prescribed another medication to help with their complaint, whatever their primary complaint is. And we're seeing these drug interactions that are causing um, death and some other long-term um, illnesses, um, seizure disorders and brain damage as a result of seizures. And it's simply because they're not listing either all of their prescription medications or all of their over-the-counter medications when they're going in to receive treatment. Um, several years ago, um, there were all these individuals that were getting really, really ill and people that were dying and they weren't sure why, but they were taking St. John's wort. You know, it's one of those over-the-counter, not regulated by the FDA supplements. You can get it at Walmart or any pharmacy. It's with all the vitamins. People were taking those in combination with some other, um, other medications and it was causing death and stroke and heart attacks and causing people to have mental health problems and suicide and nobody knew why these otherwise healthy looking individuals were coming in and dying you know in hospitals or in the the emergency personnel couldn't figure it out and they started doing some research and looking back at all the medications and people weren't listing these supplements as part of their their medical routine and so doctors were prescribing medication and there were horrible um, drug interactions that were happening and people were, were dying. Um, today, in today's world, you know, we see all of these um, 
direct sales companies. If you have Facebook, trust me, it's all over your Facebook wall. People that are selling different supplements, whether it's for weight loss or weight gain or you know, to make you feel better for your eczema, whatever, you're, you're seeing tons of these. And people are failing, um, like Renee mentioned, people are failing to tell their primary care physicians, their ER physicians, um, urgent care physicians that they're on these, these supplements, um, some of which have ingredients that, you know, don't do so well with other medications. Um, we're also seeing a lot of use of essential oils, um, I use them, I'm not going to lie, I use them too, but it's important that when you're using the essential oils and other over-the-counter remedies that you use them correctly and you make sure that you let your physician know that, that you're using them. Um, abuse of these medications, of the prescription medications and over-the-counter medications, what it looks like is using it, taking it when it belongs to somebody else. Okay, that's how, that's how we're getting most of these drugs on the street is because someone is going and getting it from a pain clinic or from their doctor and then they're selling it. Um, but that's what abuse looks like, taking it even if it belongs to your friend or your mom or your child or whatever, that's still abuse. Um, taking drugs in a higher quantity or in another manner than they are prescribed is also abuse of these, of these pills. Um, we see a lot of individuals who are, you know, melting the pills down. They're using them um, intravenously. Um, individuals that crush them and snort them. And, of course, we know that when you're using these medications in a way other than what they're intended to be used, there are some significant health problems that occur. Um, the pharmaceutical company designed these pills to um, capsules, tablets, whatever they happen to be, I'm just going to say pills, they designed them to be taken orally, unless otherwise directed, of course, but they're designed to take orally. Um, the coating breaks down. Um, it is um, metabolized either in your liver or your stomach or where your intestines. They're designed to, to work that way. They're designed to be taken orally. Their half-life is designed for you to only take it every certain number of hours. And so when you're taking them in ways that is improper or in ways that has not been prescribed to you, then you're running a much higher risk of overdose. Some of the effects on our health. Um, cardiovascular problems, huge, huge, huge um, with these um, prescription medications. We're seeing individuals who are otherwise healthy, so we think that are coming in in cardiac arrest, um, and it, they're in respiratory failure, and they're in heart failure, and it's because, um, especially with the pain medications, it's because of the way that these drugs are designed to work. They're ingredients. They are designed to, you know, maybe depress cough or pain or whatever, and they, if they are, um, they work on because of your brain chemistry. That's how they work. So a lot of times we're seeing people come in with those cardiovascular problems, respiratory failure, um, because of these these drugs. Um, a lot of times we see loss of coordination, um, which causes accidents. Um, and individuals who already have some kind of respiratory problems or cardiac problems are at much higher risk for um, negative consequences. Um, because of certain prescription medications and over-the-counter medications. Um, increased heart rate and increased, increased blood pressure, again, that puts people at much higher risk for um, heart attacks, for stroke, and we're seeing a lot of that. Um, emergency rooms are seeing a lot of young individuals come in that are having strokes. Um, and it's because of increased heart rate, increased blood pressure that are associated with um, prescription medications. Sexually transmitted diseases are also on the list of consequences for these and pretty much all substances because when you use substances, your inhibitions are somewhat, you know, they just kind of go away sometimes. Um, so people are much more likely to um, act in ways that are maybe not their, their general character. Amphetamines. We, Alabama is a rural state, and at one point, uh, a small county in Alabama was the leading meth producer in, in America. 
Um, and methamphetamines, especially in rural counties, we're seeing um, has become a huge, huge problem. Um, I have family from South Alabama, and um, it's very rural, lots of farm, uh, farmland, and their communities are almost devastated because of the effects of amphetamine use, especially methamphetamine. Um, it, is a, it is a stimulant, so it increases everything in our body, um, makes it work a little bit faster. Um, it's highly addictive, highly, highly addictive. Um, most of, we've seen it, we know what it looks like, we've seen it on the news or on the internet. I mean, people use it in a lot of different ways. People eat it, they smoke it, they snort it, they inject it. Um, so with those different methods of using um, come a lot of different health problems. Um, wakefulness, we see uh, is a lot of truck drivers at one point were using it back in like the 70s and 80s because they were able to drive much longer distances and get more money and more work done because of its stimulant effect. Um, a lot of individuals have increased activity. Um, you see them just running around getting doing this and doing that, um, including uh, other including some activities like picking or hair pulling because of the increased activity of their brain, the stimulation that it comes with their brain. Um, also, individuals have a decreased appetite. Um, <laughs> where uh, down in South Alabama, one of, the, one of the, the jokes is it's the such and such diet, the name of the town diet. Uh, because you see all of these individuals that all of a sudden are losing all this weight and you know, and you're wondering what in the world is going on, and, and a lot of times those individuals have problems with amphetamines. Um, it increases your respiration rate, it increases your heart rate, and it also causes your heart rate to be irregular. Um, it increases your blood pressure, your body temperature, um, and, and the reason that it does this is just simply because of its chemical makeup. And this is particularly dangerous for uh, individuals, again, that already have some sort of predisposition to respiratory or um, cardiac problems. Again, we're seeing young people, like 20 years old, that are presenting with um, heart attacks in your local emergency room or in your ca uh, primary care physician's office or your urgent care. And more, a lot of times it's because of methamphetamines or other stimulant drugs that they're using. Um, people that use methamphetamine and abuse methamphetamine are much more likely to contract HIV and hepatitis B. And again, it's just because of the nature of, of the drug. Um, some of the club drugs that we don't always talk a whole lot about, um, GHB, ketamine, rohypnol, um, a lot of times we, in college towns like here in Montgomery, I know we, we have a hard time thinking of Montgomery as a college town, but, but it is. Um, these are always popular, unfortunately, uh, especially with young people. Um, again, most of the time we know people put them in the drink or um, people take them orally. They can be snorted as well. Um, they're, pretend they're very dangerous, especially because they're odorless, they're colorless. Uh, and a lot of times individuals don't know that they're, be they're being given this drug. Um, there was a story out several, several years ago of an individual who um, was at a party and there was a water bottle, no label on it, just a water bottle, and it looked like it was filled with water. And um, they drank from the water bottle and they died. And it was because they overdosed on GHB um, because it is, it's odorless and colorless. Um, and ketamine is another one of the club drugs that we see most often. It's not quite as popular as it was at one time, but usually people either um, inject it straight into muscle tissue or, um, or snort it. Um, but some of the problems is insomnia, anxiety, tremors, sweating. Uh, we see a lot of people that end up going into comas and are having seizures because of the use of these club drugs. Um, Insomnia, of course, we know is, is particularly dangerous because people, when you don't sleep, you don't operate as well. Your, your cognitive processes are slower. Your ability to reason and your ability to judge are much, much, uh, are, are definitely effective. They're much slower. 
um, we see a lot of the sweating because of the increase of um, body temperature. Uh, seizures, and the seizures are one of the things that um, probably the largest health problem that we see with these drugs because we know that prolonged seizures can cause um, brain damage. And so a lot of young people and older people, I know I keep saying young people, but uh, a lot of, of individuals um, are developing seizure disorders and are receiving brain damage as a result of the use of these, of these drugs. Um, again, like almost every single drug that we've talked about so far, it increases your blood pressure and it causes respiratory problems. Um, I can't say it enough, people that are already at risk for these um, specific types of diseases are at much higher risk um, to have long-term damage to their heart, to their other cardiovascular organs, to their brain um, as a result of this drug use. Um, and again, the respiratory problems are because of the, the center of your brain, the control part where it affects, where these drugs um, have their greatest effect. Um, I want to talk about bath salts for a moment. Um, we've seen tons and tons of news stories lately about bath salts, about um, these legal amphetamines, about um, spice and other, uh, and other um, uh, chemicals of that sort. Um, bath salts, they're very similar to amphetamines. Individuals that are using them are most of the time using them to avoid testing positive for amphetamines on drug tests. Um, again, just like with methamphetamine, you can take it orally, uh, it can be injected, it can be snorted. Um, it produces that euphoria. That we've that we've talked about with so many of these drugs, that feeling of um, uh, increased sociability. I'm on top of the world. I love everybody, and it increases individual sex drives. Um, so again, and, and it's, it has a lot to do with the fact that um, of the part of the brain where this particular drug um, affects. Um, some of the health consequences with the use of bath salts are pretty, are pretty significant. Um, they are very similar a lot of times to um, what we see in individuals with severe schizophrenia. Um, paranoia, significant paranoia, agitation, hallucinations, um, and other psychotic behavior. Um, and we see all of these things, and a lot of times they're going into the emergency room and people are giving them mental health medications because they think, oh my goodness, this person has had a psychotic break. This person um, has severe schizophrenia. But in reality, this person is just on bath salts. This person has a problem with substance abuse. Um, also, panic attacks. Panic attacks are huge um, with bath salts. There's a lot of people that will present to the emergency rooms and other um, health care facilities um, thinking that they are having a heart attack. Um, their chest hurts, their arm hurts, they can't breathe. But in reality, it's a panic attack or anxiety attack that is brought on by the use of, these, of, of this particular chemical. So the important thing with all of this, you know, we've talked about what substance abuse is. So it's continued use despite negative consequences. We know what that is. We know what substance abuse is now. We know how some of those substances relate to other illnesses that we have, um, whether it be exacerbation of diabetes or brain injuries because of seizures or um, cardiovascular problems, respiratory failure, respiratory problems. Um, one that I didn't mention that I should have mentioned, but especially individuals that are using um, drugs, um, IV drugs that are injecting drugs, skin lesions, hepatitis C um, are, are rampant in the community of individuals that are using IV drugs. Um, and a lot of times, uh, individuals will completely destroy um, their veins. They destroy their, their, their vascular system because of in, in, injecting drugs. 
you know, you can only inject so many times, especially if you're not a medical professional, um, until your vein is absolutely destroyed. And we're seeing individuals with, you know, huge, large, like hematomas and other type, almost like boils um, on their skin, and it's because of IV drug use. Um, it's not pretty, it's not glamorous, and the major problem is um, infection that it comes along um, with the drug use, with IV drug use. Um, most, more often than not, when you have people that come in and have um, infection, like on the lining of their heart, um, which is pretty rare when you see someone come in like that, and most of the time it's from IV drug use. Um, because when you're shooting up in, in those veins, you know, of course, it spreads through your whole body, and it gets in your bloodstream, and your heart is, is being used to pump those drugs in, in your blood throughout, throughout the rest of your body. Um, so infection is another huge problem, um, not to mention... Um, we're seeing people with um, like tuberculosis and things of that sort um, because they're being infected through you know other people and because of you know dirt, uh, unsanitary living conditions, uh, poor access to health care, or just um, not interested in health care. So we're seeing a lot of those illnesses as well. Um, brain injury—that's another one I would like to mention too. Um, that we see a, a lot with, with drug and alcohol abuse. Um, so the important part, again, let me get back on track. The important part is where do we go for help? Well, in the state of Alabama, we have a long, long list of really great substance abuse treatment facilities. Um, here locally in Montgomery, I'm going to go through a couple of areas. We're going to talk about Montgomery and Birmingham area. Um, and then a few down in South Alabama as well. Uh, but here in Montgomery, the uh, Montgomery Area Mental Health Authority is um, the community mental health center here in Montgomery. They have offices in Montgomery, Elmer County, Lowndes County, and Otaga County. Um, not only do they provide mental health care, but they also provide substance abuse treatment. Um, and most of the time they refer individuals out for that. Um, to some of the other places that we're going to talk about, like Lighthouse Counseling Center. Um, they're also here in Montgomery. They've done some excellent work. Um, and Mental Health America in Montgomery works closely with Lighthouse. Um, Lighthouse has a wonderful dual diagnosis program, meaning an individual with mental health problems and a substance abuse problem. They have a program specifically tailored to those individuals with, um, with dual diagnoses. And it's um, particularly helpful because not only do they um, help with the substance abuse problem, but they also provide the mental health treatment um, as well. Um, CAP, or Chemical Addictions Program, they're also here in Montgomery. Um, they have an intensive outpatient program as well as a residential program. Um, and they are used um, uh, very often um, by our Community Corrections Department and um, other community correction type um, organizations here in Montgomery. Um, also Bradford Health Services, um, they have locations all over the state of Alabama. Um, they, are, they are here in Montgomery as well. Uh, Faith Rescue Mission, they're really good about um, helping when we have referrals. Um, and, and they have um, some substance abuse uh, treatment options available. Always, you know, if someone is in crisis, whether it be a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue, um, if, or if you are worried about someone, or, you know, tell your, tell your clients, your patients, whoever, you know, if you are concerned that someone is having, uh, you know, has a drug problem or having a drug overdose problem or um, some kind of negative consequence as a result of drug use, you can always call 911 or go to your local emergency room to get the assistance that you need. Um, some of the other places... It's not on this slide show, <laughs> but um, you can look through um, SAMHSA, which is a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. 
their website has an excellent um, resource available. Basically, um, you, you fill in a little box. It asks like for your location or for your uh, zip code, your state. So there's a lot of ways that you can search for, for substance abuse providers. You fill in that box and it gives you a long list of, um, I mean really <laughs> long list of substance abuse treatment facilities that have been approved by the state of Alabama's Department of uh, Mental Health or Department of Mental Health. Um, a lot of times that people don't know to go and look at that list so as nurses and social workers and other um, health care providers it's important that you know that that resource is available. Um, also, I'm sure that the Alabama Department of Public Health can help you to get that information, as well as the Alabama Department of Mental Health. Um, they have this, basically, they have like a database that has tons and tons of information about where you can go for help. Anywhere in the state of Alabama, this is really important, anywhere in the state of Alabama, you can dial the phone number 211. You dial it like you would dial 911. Or if anybody, I don't know if anybody uses 411 anymore because you always kind of look it up on our phone these days or on the internet, but you dial it just like that. Um, and 211 is um, a program that is sponsored by Hands on River Region. 211 Connects. Anywhere in the state of Alabama, you dial 211 and tell them what your problem is. Hey, I'm looking for substance abuse uh, treatment facilities no problem and they they connect you with those individuals or hey I'm looking for um, mental health services they can give you a list of those um, I'm looking for a health clinic they can give you those so any kind of resource that you can imagine and that's available in the state of Alabama 211 can get you connected with those individuals um, also, you can call Mental Health America in Montgomery. Uh, we can be reached at 334-262-5500, um, um, There are a couple of other um, Mental Health America affiliates in the state of Alabama, but most of the time we filled all of the calls um, for referrals for, um, for all of our affiliates. So, um, if you are in the Mobile area, it's not a problem. Call us. Call us. Call 211, the Department of Public Health, the Department of, uh, of Mental Health, and we can get you the resources that are available in your community. Uh, most of the time, it just takes three seconds for us to look it up really quick or, you know, look it up in our database or in our, on our phone list, and we can get you the resources that you need. Um, so those are some of the resources that are available to you. They're not just available to you as a health provider. They're available to anyone, um, and I highly recommend using um, the search engine that is on SAMHSA's website because, again, those um, treatment facilities are all approved by the State Department of Mental Health. Um, and if you look at the State Department of Mental Health's website, you will find a link to SAMHSA's website. Um, so, again, it's really important that when you're referring people to treatment, that you are referring them to agencies and uh, facilities that have been approved um, that go through state approval processes. Um, any questions? We actually have a few. Okay. Very good. Um, the first one's asking what you would recommend saying to someone who thinks marijuana use is okay and that it will not lead to the use of other drugs. Okay, well, you know, a lot of times it, it depends on the individual. There are some, like I mentioned earlier, there's some individuals that are just going to argue down no matter what. But it is important for individuals to know that any drug, any foreign substance that you put in your body can be particularly harmful to you. Um, and that's even medications that have been pre prescribed to you. Everything that you put in your body, food, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, all of it can have some kind of negative um, or harmful consequence. Um, it has been shown that marijuana usage does lead, it's called a gateway drug, because it does lead to the usage of, of, of other drugs. Um, and that's simply because uh, most of the time people are curious and they want to try something different. Um, so 
a lot of people will argue that it's not a gateway drug and that it, isn't, that it doesn't lead to the, the usage of other drugs, but it does. And there are a lot of scientific information that, that proves that and that points to that. And also, when, you, when you're talking about individuals who um, are self-managing their other illnesses, mm -hmm. such as diabetes, hypertension, yep. whatever, the lack of motivation mm -hmm. that comes along with the marijuana usage can also cause them to not necessarily be motivated to take care of themselves or take their medicine on time. The weight gain can have a tremendous impact on how their other medications are uh, metabolized. Yeah, and you know, a lot of times um, we think about like that 35-year-old dude sitting in the basement of his parents' house eating Cheetos and playing video games, you know, that lack of motivation. <laughs> I know that's kind of funny, but I mean, it's the truth. Um, that lack of motivation is actually called, it has a name, it's amotivational syndrome, and a lot of times it can be pointed back to marijuana usage. Any other okay. questions? Yes, the next one is asking um, if you can talk more about the increase in heroin use in Alabama. Mm -hmm. Yep, heroin is, you know, for many, many years, we thought, oh, we don't have a problem with that. That's not, we don't, you know. But in the state of Alabama, it's becoming more and more and more prevalent. The usage is becoming more prevalent. And again, it's readily available. It's easily um, accessible. Um, and it is causing a lot of health problems. Um, and it's causing our community and our health care systems a lot of problems um, because of um, overdosing, accidents that are occurring, as especially um, uh, motor vehicular accidents, accidents on the job, um, and we're seeing a lot of individuals that are developing um, kidney failure as a result also. Um, and it, again, it's just because of the chemical makeup of the drug. But heroin use has really taken, there's been a surge in heroin use in the past few years in the state of Alabama, particularly for some reason in areas Birmingham and North we're seeing really significant um, increases in those areas. Okay. Uh, the last one's asking um, if inpatient treatment is better than outpatient treatment in terms of addiction. Well, my personal opinion is if you have an individual that has a serious substance abuse problem, I think that residential inpatient treatment is definitely your first step. Um, because in most inpatient facilities, there are medical professionals there that are available to help with the management of withdrawal symptoms and other um, chronic illnesses that come along with the substance abuse. So I highly recommend um, residential treatment. Um, but I believe that the residential treatment should be followed up with an intensive outpatient treatment. Um, most individuals, they don't um, become a person addicted to a substance overnight. So it's not going to be overnight that this problem um, resolves. Most of the time, it's a lifelong process. It's, it takes many years for most individuals to, to, com you know, to complete recovery or to be in recovery. Um, so I think the best practice for me uh, personally, I believe, is that you do the residential treatment first and then do the intensive outpatient treatment. But we're seeing a lot um, of individuals, especially that are involved in the criminal justice system, they're sending them to the intensive outpatient treatment um, only. And I hate to say it, but it's because it's a much cheaper option. Um, but I believe the best option is to do residential inpatient and then do outpatient as well as um, continue going to groups and other um, follow-up programs as well. Okay, do we have any other questions? None in the audience? Brittany, thank you so much for Yes, coming you're so today. welcome. I, I, the cost is, the financial cost is staggering, mm -hmm. but the human cost is even, it's incomprehensible really, Absolutely. because this has such long-term effects. Mm -hmm. And so we, we really appreciate you coming today. Absolutely. For those of you who are um, ADPH employees, I will put a list of these resources on our website. It, well, not on the website, but it will be on the document library. So you should find that in the next day or so. It will be under the social work unit. Thank you very much.